So selling a variety of things on Teachable becomes very difficult. We've got around about 60 or 70 courses in our portfolio. So we've gone for a volume strategy, low cost, high volume. Hello, and welcome to the art of selling online courses. We're here to share winning strategies and secret hacks from top performers in the online course industry. My name is John Ainsworth, and today's guest is Rick Davidson. Rick's been making video games for a living for more than 13 years as a designer, producer, creative director, and executive producer. He's created games for console, mobile, PC, and Facebook. And he founded an indie game studio, Inspirado Games, which has been acquired back in 2012 by Electronic Arts. So today we're going to be talking about gamedev.tv, where Rick is now selling courses. We're going to be talking about how he set it up, how he built an audience, the funnels they use, and their current challenges. Now, before we dig into today's interview, I want to remind you of how much your support means to us. We're here to make your podcast experience even better, and you can help us with just a quick favor. So by taking a moment to rate and review our podcast, you're going to give us priceless feedback that helps shape future episodes. Has this show helped you make money? Has it helped you grow your business? Has it helped you improve your courses? If it has, please share it in the reviews. Go to ratethispodcast.com slash online courses. Nothing would make me happier today than to hear how this show has helped you. We've done over 100 episodes of the show today, and I'm dying to know which one was your favorite, which guest you enjoyed the most. Who would you love to hear from as the next guest on the show? Make my day and let me know in a review. Go to ratethispodcast.com slash online courses and let me know what you think. And let's make this podcast the best that it can be. Rick, welcome to the show. John, thank you. So, talk us through who do you help with your courses and what kind of problem are you solving for them? Mm, we help people get good at game development. There's a lot of people out there who, as hobbyists, have a passion for games. They like playing games, they like talking about games, and they're really interested in making games. And it's never been easier to jump into a game engine and make a game, but it's still super complicated. So we take people through that process of, here's where to start. We, we focus on beginners to intermediates, mostly. People who are interested in just, I've always wanted to make a game, I want to make a game, how do I go yep. about doing it? So that's the primary primary need we're okay, meeting. Cool. So how many courses are you guys selling at the moment? We've got around about 60 or 70 Whoa, courses in our portfolio. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so all right, let, let me, yeah, it, is, it's, it is a lot. So let me start straight away by showing our, our business model, talking about our business model. So uh, Game Dev TV started it, its existence making courses for Udemy. And as we know, Udemy discounts courses down to pretty low. So $10, $15, dollars So we've gone for a volume strategy, low cost, high volume. And I'm, I'm excited by that. I mean, I like that model because we help a lot of people. And so to do that, we continue to make a lot of courses. We partner up with instructors. Uh, the instructors we work with are usually on a royalty, uh, royalty deal. And we just try to make a course a month that's going to add value to our community. Wow, got it. Okay, cool. So do you still, I saw you selling courses on your site. Do you still sell them on Udemy as well? We do. Yeah, we do both. So it's a really interesting, I, I don't know if any of your audiences created courses for Udemy or any other marketplace, but it's often that dance between how do we satisfy the needs of the marketplace, but also grow our own presence, our own brand, our own relationship with the customer. So we've got a fantastic relationship with Udemy. They've really springboarded our brand and our company over the, over the years. So we try to make sure that we're always fitting within what works for them. But at the same time, we don't want to be beholden to the marketplace because Udemy changes their policies all yeah. the time. They they use the percentage uh, revenue share to their partners yeah. all the time, uh, not, not in the positive <laughs> direction. And <laughs> Funny how that goes, isn't it? <laughs> We've decided to give you more money it, it, this it month, is, right? It is, it is. Yeah, oh, thanks, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's... So for us, building our own... Uh, website where we sell our courses has been an ongoing journey and we've been doing that for three or four years now and it allows us to own the conversation and we have been spending the last uh, I'd say 12 to 18 months building our own bespoke platform from scratch up until now we've been using Teachable as our platform for hosting our own courses uh, but there's limitations on that and we've got to the size of the business now where we need to get more sophisticated with our analytics and with our uh, our sales funnel and just the the levers that we can pull. So we've gone through that. Um, I'm not going to call it fun, but it's through yeah. that process of building our own home. And it's, we're probably about a month away from launching Okay, that. nice. Now I've got my own personal opinions about the limitations of Teachable from the point of view of funnels. 
what some of the stuff that you found as limitations what's been holding you back there yeah the biggest limitation i'd say is teachable is fantastic if you've got a couple of courses mm -hmm. you, you land on your site you know my site dot teachable or if you've got it uh your own your own domain for that then you land there here's a couple of courses check them out it's great for an organization like ours with 60 or 70 courses and probably over the years 10 20 50 100 different bundles where we'll say let's take those three courses bundle them together those five courses bundle them together and we've started selling asset packs which is basically uh 3d art that you put into your game world that game developers can can purchase so if you're making a game you've got the coding aspect of it you've also got the assets that go into the game we teach people how to make those assets but a lot of people don't want to make the assets themselves they just want to purchase them and, and put them in the game so selling a variety of things on teachable becomes very difficult the there's not really a, a marketplace that we can uh, we can set up ourselves so that that's been the biggest limitation second big limitation would be just the sales pages it's um, difficult to get a custom landing page for a um I, i'd say a bespoke campaign if we want to run a workshop for example then we're constrained by the sales page structure that we would need to use to sell our courses so we're gonna have to jam everything the square pegs into the round hole of how do we sell courses if we want to sell other things in there as well and then the analytics um you know when you work with a, an organization they own your data they can share certain things with you we we have a lot of information obviously on our sales and our number of students and lecture completions etc but the the nuances of shopping cart abandonment for example we can't get to just because of the limitations of teachable the things that piss me off with teachable are the sales page is bad like it's really bad but you can build the sales page somewhere else you can say right i'm going to set up the sales page in wordpress click funnels whatever and just have mm -hmm. a checkout in teachable that's doable it is doable to do the sales page and checkout separately and then link it with teachable for the actual delivery of the course that is possible but it becomes a bit of a pain in the butt if you stick with teachable for the checkout pages their checkout pages suck like from a conversion point of view they're just rubbish there's like really there's like six crucial elements to have on a on a checkout page and you can have like four of them on on teachable but you can't have them in the structure and the order that you want so for example you want to have really good testimonials on the checkout page to remind people when they're right at that point of deciding whether to buy you want to have testimonials to make people feel really comfortable and like yes i'm making the right decision here and they're like way down the page they're off the page so if you're on de even if you're on desktop you're still probably not going to be able to see those testimonials unless you scroll down which is ridiculous from a conversion mm. point of view and i don't know why they do that because they would make way more money if they had better performing checkout page like as a company they would make way more money if the checkout pages were better their order bumps are okay their upsells are terrible like the up the the process for being able to actually make the upsell is just really bad in there uh you can't add in a second order bump you can't add in a second upsell you can't add in a downsell it's like from a funnel point of view i'm just like oh my god <laughs> yeah it, it's it's fairly constrained yeah. it's like what if someone already owns the thing we're trying to order bump them to well i don't know they get to see it again uh but it's if anyone's starting out i think teachable is fantastic oh, i would so simple 100 percent recommend yeah. it i would 100 percent recommend it as a as a starting thing and building your own platform that's you know oh, yeah. that's no fun as we're going through that process we we probably generate about 10 percent uh, of our revenue from order bump bumps on teachable okay. so they didn't have them for a long time and then they did have them and we started playing around with them and uh order bumps at least it's better than nothing mm -hmm. uh the way that they've implemented it but yeah i so the average that we're seeing across our clients is about 19 percent for order bumps so i would say there's probably potential for that number even to go up higher for you guys do you know what kind of conversion rate you're getting in terms of the percentage of people who buy them from any of those or you know not just the revenue but the percentage you're actually making the sale no okay. uh, no i don't well i mean yeah 10 percent of our sales i i think it's 10 percent of our sales i'm just i'm ballparking yeah, 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 it yeah. i haven't looked at these numbers recently apologies uh but um yeah i don't yeah and this is one of those things that teachable doesn't make it super easy for me to just go click click and find that percentage of the number of people who are 
Maybe they do, and I haven't looked at it recently. I'm looking at it right now to see if I can find some more. <laughs> yeah, I'd be surprised. Hunt. I don't think so. I don't think many platforms would do nah. that. We do a lot of stuff like that in spreadsheets to like do all of the analysis and go, okay, right, where's the where's the sales coming in from? What's below benchmark? Yeah. What could be improved? Because a lot of systems, it's like even even if you take some complex analytics system, that's very tricky to get exactly the bit that you're after. Whereas if you put it in a spreadsheet, you can just do it however you want. Question for you: Have you? Have you or any of the people you've worked with used PostHog for analytics? No, I never heard of it. What is it? Okay, it's something that we we started. We looked at for our A/B testing for our new platform. You know, this is all big stuff and plugging it together. And they've got a, a fairly decent looking analytics platform as well, and priced in a more reasonable way than some of the other analytics platforms we're looking at. So, just curious to see if you've heard about it, but. Go to go to posthog.com. I'm not affiliated with them, but we're hoping to to use them and integrate them into our system. It looks really looks really good. Looks for I'm excited. John, I can't tell you how much I'm excited. You were asking about limitations of Teachable. For us to get there and say, what about this course image versus that course image? Mm. What about this copy versus that copy? What about this price versus that price? And to do some actual proper A B testing on our funnel, whew, that is going to be we're just going to be bouncing around giddy with joy. <laughs> A-B testing things that didn't need A-B testing because you can. Yeah, it's so yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Should, we, should we write the word and or should we use the ampersand <laughs> symbol? Okay, right, let's, let's do two weeks of A-B testing on that. It's very important. So take me back with this whole thing, right? So you start, did you start with Udemy in order to start making course sales or did you have, did you build up your own audience? Um, separately to that? Like, were you doing SEO? And, and where, where, is, where is the bulk of your audience, by the way? Is it SEO, YouTube? How are you getting people in? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you two paths very quickly. I won't go into the long history. But for me personally, I was doing more of a uh, YouTube to a high price point slash uh, consulting and coaching funnel. Okay. I was doing that for a number of years and I was helping indie game developers to uh, to start their studios or to grow their studios. And it was it was a high price point philosophy. And I was getting a little bit fatigued with coaching. Yeah. If, you know, for anyone who's done coaching, there's a lot of, did you do your homework? You know, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't didn't. really want to talk about Why not? <laughs> well, all right. Well, that's, that's why you're not doing well then. Uh, did, yeah. So there was a lot of that that I found frustrating and I felt like I was only helping a handful of people. So yep. I uh, came across uh, my now business partner, Ben Tristam. He was the original founder of Game Dev TV. And I came along after he'd already had some success with a couple of courses and he had a very Udemy centric philosophy. So he got on Udemy, created a course, it bombed miserably, created another course, it bombed miserably. And then uh, through various circumstances in his own journey, he came across a need for teaching Unity, the game engine. So he created a course on that, but he started it with Kickstarter. So he went out, I'm doing a Kickstarter to do the best Unity course possible. Um, got some good attention and then created the course on Udemy and because it converted well and he's a charming fellow, Udemy saw some good numbers there. So they put a lot of um, marketing traffic towards that specific course uh, and and so that bootstrapped and that got the whole brand going. And then I came along shortly after that and said, hey, well, you know, let's team up on a couple of things together. And then after a short amount of time, it, I, I saw that the opportunity to make high volume, low cost was a lot more attractive to me. Ben already had a foothold. His brand was already, um, you know, already known. So I sort of threw away my, my personal brand um, and wrapped myself up in the Game Dev TV brand. And from that point on, it was a few years of just very Udemy centric. And in the early days of Udemy, if you had, for example, a, a, I don't know, 100,000 students that you'd taught from your courses on Udemy, and you sent out a message saying, we've got a new course, a good portion of that 100,000 students saw that piece of communi communication. So launches were very buoyant way back in the early days of Udemy. And then over time, I think a combination of there were too many instructors spamming. So the student themselves would say, I don't want to see anything else from Udemy, like oh, too, too many messages because I've bought five courses from five instructors and they're all messaging me so often telling me stuff. That was one. And I think I, I don't have any any confirmation on this, but I would be massively surprised if Udemy didn't get there and say, why are we delivering these messages to all of that person's um, target audience? That's super, super valuable. And when the instructor promotes their next thing to their current students, 
the instructor gets the lion's share of the sale. They get most of the the pro ninety seven percent. Right. And uh, Udemy business point of view, that doesn't make sense. They want to give that new course uh, enough chance to survive, and and they want to give that instructor enough, uh, I guess, oxygen to breathe. But they're not going to deliver it to. I, I've I don't know the number now. I think we've got something like 2 million students that we've had on Udemy. There's zero There's zero chance that Udemy is delivering our messages to 2 million students. It's like, that's valuable. So uh, that that's a limitation of, of working with Udemy, I think. And then do you do anything to get the contact details of those Udemy students into your John, Gen don't, Dev TV? don't get me cancelled. <laughs> don't, don't you? No, don't. <laughs> okay, so this is... If anyone from Udemy is listening, <laughs> no, we would never, ever do that. How dare you suggest such a thing? But if I was to start from scratch, then I would absolutely uh, work within the rules to do everything I could to get people from Udemy to my own site. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, anyway, but joking aside, <laughs> that's part of the part of the dance where, um, you know, if you're, if you're serious about a Udemy partnership, you need to treat it seriously and respect the fact that they've gone and found the traffic for you. You've putting something on their marketplace. And if your strategy is just solely, I'll do something really quick and crap on Udemy so that I can get people over to my my more important thing over here, then I, I think everyone smells it and sees it and it doesn't work so well. So we try to have a little bit more of a, um, if you purchase a course on Udemy, you can come to our site and get that same course for free. We'll just, we'll copy it over so you can consume it in whichever place you want to. Um, and we do a couple of other soft sells as well. Um, just generally uh, having your brand name be your website, I think is a smart way to say, um, you know, this course from gamedev.tv is interesting. Oh, huh, I might just go type in gamedev.tv and see what I come up with. Uh, and, and I think that's, Udemy's fine with all that. They're not trying to completely clamp down on, you know, how dare you do any of that stuff, mm -hmm. but it's the answer of, it needs to be a good partnership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So talk to me then about how you guys have built up an audience separate to Udemy. So you do, you got a YouTube channel or how do you guys? Uh... Yeah, you know what? We we neglected our YouTube channel for a long time. If you if you were to go to the Game Dev TV YouTube channel, you'll see just trash for years and years and years. And, and when I say that, it's, um, okay, we recorded something for a course. Let's just throw it on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got an announcement to make. Let's just throw it on our YouTube channel. We may as well. We've got the content content there already. And then we entered the next phase where we said, let's do regular podcasts or live casts. So with our audience, we're chatting with them. It's not quite streaming, it, it but sort you know streaming, but we record it and then chuck it on YouTube as well. And we'll do that more as a engagement mechanism. Uh, it, keep our existing community engaged and excited. They can ask us whatever they want. They're, they're happy that they joined us and there's a little bit of that repeat purchase philosophy wrapped up inside that. Um, and at the same time, we may as well pop it on YouTube because we might get some acquisition out of that. Some people might see it who don't know about us, but when you've got a one hour, you know, as, as you know, we're doing right now a podcast, a, a, a longer form one hour chat that doesn't necessarily hit the, the viral markers on YouTube. So our longer chat podcast type strategy didn't really bring a lot of a lot of traffic on YouTube. And it's been more recently, I'd say in the past 12 months, where we properly sat down seriously and said, what would our community like to see? Mm -hmm. And what would folks who don't know about us like to see? And we've we've created a whole new type of video, which we call the battle video, where we get uh, three or four um, of our instructors to create something in one hour. And we make it exciting. And there's a little bit of banter going on and a little bit of you know, polite, friendly uh, um well, polite, maybe not the right word, but you know, we make fun of each other and it's yeah. exciting. Who can make the game? And we, we have one game engine versus another game engine versus another game engine. So if anyone's sitting there saying, oh, which game engine should I learn? They get to see a little bit of the insight of that. And so the for our YouTube channel at the time was I think about 30,000 subscribers and the first battle video got up to about 300,000 views. So nice. that confirmed, oh, this, this is a good format. It also confirms that you don't need to have a big following on any of the social media platforms to get a successful piece of content, which I don't think was the case a few years ago. You kind of had to build your momentum up. But nowadays, you can do something spectacular. And if you've got two subs and you do a really great video, you can have a million view video just because the video is spectacular, I, I believe. Um, 
So that was, that's sort of our YouTube evolution and we're taking it more seriously now, but it's the age old question of, should we make more content, more courses, or should we make uh, free uh, YouTube videos? A and so I'd say, John, the strategy we've had for years and years and years has just been, let's treat our current customers and community really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so that they hang, hang around and stay and talk to other people, word of mouth, et cetera about who we are and what we're up to. So um, we've had a, a good forum that we've moderated. We have a very strong Q&A strategy. We have teaching assistants for every course, like an actual real person who answers questions, make sure people don't get stuck. Um, and then we, our forum, and then Discord. So our community was just, we want Discord. So, okay, here we go. I think we've got up to 90,000 folks in our Discord server oh, now. Wow. But not, not at any one point in time. It's, you know, it's in the single digit thousands per week, but yep. people who are members of the, the Discord um, server are up to, I'd looked just before, 90,000 or so. Nice. That's really strong. So, yeah, I found that the thing that you're talking about with the videos in terms of one video from someone who's got low subscribers can just go completely crazy. I, I find that fascinating. And one yeah. of the things that we started working on our own YouTube game recently, and one of the things we're always doing is looking and trying to find what are those videos anybody else has made? Can we make something kind of like that and find something that our audience wants or that goes viral for us? And I, I find it fascinating. I found this one meditation. It was a specific kind of meditation. I forget what the, the name of it was. But this woman had five videos. She was a yoga teacher. She lived in like uh, the Midlands in, in the UK. And she had, let's say, you know, 50 subscribers, something like that, right? And most of her videos had... 17 views or 123 views or whatever and then this one had 8.6 million <laughs> it was just like <laughs> somehow this had just hit and i was like i don't think she knows what to do with that right <laughs> because yes. she could potentially off the back of that we go all oh, right cool, i'm gonna make more videos like that i'm gonna yeah. double down on that thing i'm gonna become an online influencer around this i'm gonna make courses around this and make tons of money but i suspect from what i was seeing the fact there was nothing else on there on her channel that she was just like i guess i'll carry on being a yoga teacher and i've got a video with millions of views you know it's so it's also so tough you, you catch lightning in a bottle and then you say great we'll do the same thing and the next time around it doesn't doesn't work yeah. anywhere near as well and you're like <laughs> what was the magic in the first one oh i've got it i think you can drive yourself a little bit crazy trying to chase the the magic yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. we'll do a video that like i was saying before gets three hundred thousand views and then we'll do another one that i think is even better that gets ten thousand views like what, right, yeah, yeah. Hey, what was it the thumbnail was it the title was it the hook was it the who who you know who knows so yeah i find youtube fascinating and frustrating and i think <laughs> for anyone with a youtube centric strategy you just need i think you have to be true to yourself in terms of if i think i'm adding value whether that's education whether it's entertainment yep. whether it's solving people's problems if you're adding value you just keep doing it and keep doing it and not stress too much about what's the best way to perfect thumbnails today because i think you can fall into the trap of um okay everyone's doing thumbnails this way so i'll do thumbnails that way as well everyone's doing their titles this way i'll do titles that way as well and then you're just catching up to what everyone's doing but the market is kind of over that that satiated with that particular strategy so the thought leaders are now doing a different thing so a, a month or two later you realize what the thought leader is doing and you try to catch up to that as well so I think if you have a philosophy where you just say, what do I like? What do I think looks good? What's clear and what's interesting? And, and I'll jump in and do that. So yeah, I love it. And then what's your model in terms of getting people? Oh, sorry, I forgot to, to finish up on that one. What size is your YouTube channel up to now? Oh, it's about 38, 40,000 ish. Yeah. Subscribers. Um, yes. Yeah, subscribers. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. And our strategy is let's produce less good things as opposed mm -hmm. to um more frequent things we've also spent a lot of however contrary to that point we've also spent a lot of time playing around with short form videos and what works and for the past i'd say three to six months we've spent way more time and effort on short form which i don't think is a great way to build subscribers mm. and to, to be honest everyone talks about short form it's so critical it's so important it builds your business i'm i'm yet to see exactly the payoff for it because my gut feeling is maybe you can you've got some thoughts on this as well john my, my feeling is for us anyway long form has people get a relationship with us 
They might mm-hmm. become a subscriber. They might check out our website and check out our courses and products because we've given them enough value. Short form um, is really good once you've already got a fair amount of traction as a reminder. It's like, oh, hey, that's John. I recognize him. I remember him. I saw him. You know, I watched one of his videos six months ago. But I think using short form as a uh, as a brand awareness tool, I, I'm not sh- I'm not sure about it's uh, unless you've got a very distinct personality and face and it's one person. Uh, it, it's I think it's trickier to get people to remember you and get a relationship with them from short form. The thing that seems to be, I'm by no means a YouTube expert, the thing that seems to be from what we've we've experimented with it so far is that the the short form then increases engagement with the long form. And then the long form is what then leads to subscribers or people signing up to the email list. So it's like going another level higher in the funnel. So you've already got long form content you're putting out there in order to get people onto the email list, in order to get people to buy the courses. And then above that, the short form then seems to increase engagement with the long form. But I don't have nearly enough data to say that I'm like, I'm right on that. Like the how much yeah. it makes a difference with it, you know? Yeah, I I understand. A, a lot of, I think a lot of short form is, well, I've got the long form there. I may as well chop it up and make some shorts out of it because it's, it's quick and easy. Right. I often wonder, are you better off just making another long form video instead of chopping things up? But, um, you know, for us, we've got a, a, a decent team size. We've got folks on the team who can chip away at these things and experiment with it. And we do have the luxury of playing around with it. But if someone's more of a solo creator, then I think picking one or two things that you really master and really put your time and effort and love into is a way better strategy than trying to shotgun across Instagram and TikTok and YouTube shorts and LinkedIn and so on. Just m- make good quality long form videos and then have that be the the key part of your funnel. Mm. So what is the next stage for you guys? Do you do a lot of work to try and get people from that long form content onto your email list? Like how do you how do you connect that with actually making sales? Yeah, we've been we've been putting a lot of love into our email list for about three years now. Um, I forget off the top of my head, a couple of hundred thousand folks on our email list. So there's definitely room for us to to expand and do better with our email list. Um, where we, uh, let's see. So without giving you 18 things at once, if you look at our, <laughs> if you look at our funnel, our funnel has done really, really well with what I call price point one. So if we've got zero to 10, zero is free and 10 is, you know, your many thousands of dollars live event or, or super consulting. And our whole business has been based upon price point one. So our courses that are listed at $200, but because they're on Udemy and because we're a Udemy partner, Udemy is like, well, we'll sell them for 10 one day and 15 another day and 20 another day. So they all get pushed down to that price point one. And that's what we've, our, our processes and our machine does really, really well creating those courses. They're, they're eight to 10 hours on average. Um, they're, they're compelling and interesting. We ask our community, what do you want us to teach next? And they tell us. Uh, and so we do that. What we've what we've not done historically is price point zero very well. YouTube videos. I was saying before that our YouTube channel has been pretty neglected. You, uh, so long form, short form, uh, all sorts of getting out there and giving people free content. We've done some lead magnet type stuff to get people into email lists, but we don't spend anywhere as much time on it as we could or should. So our strategy at the moment is putting more time into the zero price point and then more time into the three to five price point. So actively creating products that uh, different enough to a course that we can say we've got value in here that's a two or three hundred dollar value, and people aren't sitting saying, "Well, you know, in a few weeks' time it'll get discounted down to ten dollars, so I'll wait for that." They can see that it's it's a program, it's a multi week program. There's there's maybe live components to it and so on. So we're in the process of developing those. We we haven't deployed those products just yet. Uh, we do have once a year we do our lifetime member sale where we sell all of our courses and all of our future courses. And we sell that at around about that three to five price point. So 400, $500, um, which, um, you know, which is a pretty good deal. I think we try to still keep it quite reasonable if someone wants all of our stuff and all of our future stuff. And so for our business to grow, it's more people at the front of the mm-hmm. funnel and then more uh, higher price point, high value things that people look at and say, you know, dang, I really need that. And I'm more than happy to spend $300 for it. And I, I don't think in our f- near future, we'll go down the path of $1,000 or mm-hmm. more. Uh, I spent a lot of time in that, I was mentioning before, 
in my previous uh, focus in this industry. And the proposition for me of pay me $2,000 and I guarantee you, you'll get $2,000 worth of value. I think to be an integrity, you have to really give someone $2,000 of value. So if you're doing something where you say, I will teach you stock market trading, I will teach you how to optimize your funnel. So you 2X your business. I think you can you can confidently say, pay me $2,000, $3,000, whatever the price might yeah. be, and you'll get that money back. But we teach predominantly a, a hobby-based area, so people learning game development, to promise them we'll teach you how to make money from making games, I think is a very, it, it's a more tricky conversation because it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a very difficult industry to be financially buoyant by making games. It requires you know, a, lot of, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and, and a whole bunch of luck. So I like sticking more in that under 1000 price point because then we can say you'll, you'll get value out of this. Even if it won't have a financial return for you, it'll give you lots of personal value or lots of skill value. You can sell more expensive stuff in the hobby space without promising somebody will make money. Like I've got a friend who runs a um, course business around uh, musicality, how to be more musical. And mm -hmm. most of his courses are like 100, 200 bucks this kind of thing, you know, like learn to sing better, learn to be able to um, learn to be able to play by ear, this kind of thing. And then he's got a $10,000 program for people who want the one on one coaching that goes with it. And I'm pretty sure he's not teaching them how to make money from it. You know, well, that's that's a really good distinction that you've clarified there. A one on one program or a you get access to me, the expert program. Yeah. So in an organization our size, we're looking at scale. So if I create any program that requires one particular individual to be present for it, then it has a cap on the scale, yeah. Un unless we do group coaching or workshops, et cetera. But then it's very personality based. It's here's the expert. People are in love with this expert. They're the greatest person. I'll, I'll spend any money to an hour with John or oh, dream come true. Here's $10,000. That sounded dirty. It didn't mean to be, but uh, <laughs> they're coming at Maybe that's the musicality your friend does. Let's make some music, if you know what I mean. So I, I think when you when you offer access to the expert, you can charge a lot more. I absolutely agree with that. But that's something that uh, then we the, the conversation of scale, yeah. I think, becomes more tricky. You get a little bit of in the, the time for money conversation. And our business is built upon the um, you know scalability of, of digital products where um, you know it, it can scale very easily. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the reason not to do. So there's a couple of reasons I think not to sell high ticket things that, and from what I see with most of our audience in terms of what they actually want in their life, one is the, the scalability. Another one is the, they really don't want to do it. Another one is doing yeah. sales to manage that. If you're selling something that's more expensive, if you can sell it through a webinar, if it's like thousand, fifteen hundred dollars and you can sell it through a webinar, that's one thing. If you need to have sales calls and now you need to have a sale, you either do it yourself or you have a sales team. It's just like, oh, yep. who wants that? Who wants that in their life? You know, so that becomes a um, a detractor from the actual kind of lifestyle that we're trying to build when they start the business in the first place. So why would you? Why would yep. you even go there? So that part I totally understand. We do help some of our clients to sell group coaching programs because the amount of money that you can make is so much higher with those. Like it's almost like however much you're making with your main course business, you can make as much again by doing a group coaching program on top. So if that matters, then that, that really helps, you know. How, how do you handle uh, time zone disparity? Or, or do you just focus on, here's the, like, if it's live group coaching, yeah. how do you handle the fact that there's people scattered all around the world and trying to find the optimal time for them to all meet means that a lot of it's gonna end up asynchronous. You know, watch the recording afterwards and that, detracts from the value of it. Is there a strategy that you found there to make that appealing? Or you just say it's going to be, it's it's on this weekend. And if you can't make the time because you're in the wrong time zone, you know, sorry about that, maybe next time. Yeah. So for us, so we used, we used to run a group coaching program. And what we did is we had two calls, one that was very early in the day for us and one that was very late in the day for us. And that meant I that the late yeah. in the day one covered America and the early in the day one yeah. covered UK and Europe and Asia. And if you're in Australia, it was probably not a great time exactly. And we just like, okay, well, you can't cover everybody, right? And that allowed us to cover most of the most of the world. And people kind of just fitted in around that. 
Um, That's cool. We didn't have anybody, I don't think, who didn't sign up because the time zone didn't work. They figured, okay, right, I like this program. I'm going to move other stuff to kind of fit around that. And some people who are in Europe would come on both. They were like, okay, mm. cool, great. And it's like, all right, yep. if you want to. Double the knowledge. Go for it. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So what? Yeah, and what was the cadence that you would do group coaching? Uh, weekly? Yeah, we did two. Bi-weekly? We did a call every, every week or two calls, two calls per week. Yeah. Okay. Yep. For how long? How long? Was this just an ongoing, you know, stick around, pay us pay us per month and then stick around as long as you want until you've got your value? Or did you, yeah. did you have a program with an intake where you said for... You know, for three months, we'll really hammer this and then we'll refresh and get a new batch of people in. So we tested both ways. We did a group coaching cohort to start with where everybody came in at the same time. We found that a lot of people, they were ready when they were ready and that didn't quite fit with them. And I think our audience wasn't big enough for us to be able to say, right, we're going to fill this cohort. And then if people can't manage until the next one, that won't work. So then we switched to Evergreen. Once we'd gone through the cohort, we got people results. We're like, okay, let's switch to Evergreen and uh, start doing that. And then we originally were selling it as it's three months to get X amount in place. And then we realized for our model, what we're doing is we're helping people mostly to run an email promotion every single month. And so that Mm. means write the emails, update the sales page, make sure the checkout page is good, create the order bump, the upsell, or, or implement them if you've got them already. And then the next month, do it again. And so there was no real end point. It was like, just keep doing that again and again and again until rich and um so it just made sense for people to keep going through the whole through the whole program yeah we are we stopped the program because we felt it needed completely revamping and we didn't have the capacity at that time to redo it so and we were focusing more on um done for you clients so we're now completely booked up with done for you clients we're booked up with consultancy clients so we're like okay we're probably going to do it again but we're going to like we just raise it to the ground redo it take everything we've learned and make rebuild it and so we'll do one around black friday which will be probably an eight week program getting people ready to make a lot of money in in black friday so we'll do that as a cohort and see how that goes and then decide again from there so still still playing with it rick still haven't got the uh the perfect answer on this yeah yeah gotcha gotcha black friday november is our biggest month as well we find that that's when people are ready to to invest in online education. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, it's biggest month for pretty much everybody. And most people do a terrible job with their Black Friday promotion and they still do well out of it. And it's like, oh, you could have made twice as much easily, you know, so. Yeah. Do you say it like that? Ah, oh, you idiot. You could have made twice as much. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, 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 I was just thinking you're following around people saying, oh, you could have made more. And they're like, get away from me. Like, stop saying that. <laughs> Depends if I say it after they've just failed, just done it. That's no good, right? If I say it in advance and say you can make twice as much, you can. Then it can yeah, be helpful, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't go around just pissing people off. Oh, you fucked that up, didn't you? Oh, oh dear. You right. shouldn't have done it how, like that. How, how many emails did you send? Ooh, <laughs> wouldn't have done it that way. <laughs> so give anyway. people some kind of an idea of. So we've talked about like the size of your email list and the size of your Discord and what have you, your YouTube. Can you give people some kind of idea of the size of your business? I don't know if uh, in terms of revenue or number of students or anything like that. Yeah, we, it's, it's really interesting. A little formula for anyone. If you go to a Udemy course and look at the number of students and multiply that by four, maybe 4.2 or 4.3, that's how much revenue that course has generated over its lifetime. Now, there's some exceptions if someone has generated a whole bunch of traffic uh, had put it at free for a while and then changed the price point. But if you go and look at a Udemy course that has 10,000 students, that course has probably made about $40,000 over its lifetime. So um, that's just, yeah, because on average, you get about $4 from the sale. Um, so that didn't answer your question at all. I just thought I'd give that as a little tidbit if anyone wants to look at Udemy. So our revenue nowadays is probably half Udemy, half our own website. Um, between that split and then we also have some other partnerships so humble bundle is a very popular well-known uh, bundling site within the the game space they sell games and and courses etc and so we have a, a great partnership with them and that's a big chunk of our revenue as well so we're still in the the three to five million range in terms of where our business is at and the, the next leap for us is to to change up our philosophy processes 
that approach to doing things so that we start attacking that 10 to 20 range. And so, you know, as you know, there's these bumps along the road. The, the zero to one, I think, is the hardest bit. But then there's also the, you, you find your natural resting point where if, you, if you're one person or two people or a team of five, then you get to the point where you can do a certain amount of promotions, a certain amount of product, um, product development. And I think people settle around a certain point. So for our business, we've found that natural harmony point where, you know, we've got a pretty good formula or a pretty good recipe. And for us to burst into that, you know, let's, let's become a household name, so to speak, then, um, it's going to require a, a slight change to our model and to our products and to our, our strategy. Got it. Cool. If someone has heard this and they want to check out more about you guys, where should they go? Gamedev.tv for the courses, exactly. right? Yep. What's the yep. YouTube channel? TV. Is it the same? Yeah, just YouTube. I think it's forward slash gamedev.tv. I think if you search for gamedev.tv in, in Twitter and YouTube and any and Discord, anywhere you'll find us, gamedev.tv. Watch uh, it. Yep. Cool. Um, anywhere else that you want to point people to? Anywhere else people should uh, check out? But, no, that's it. Yep. Sweet. Amazing. Yep. Well, thanks so much for coming on today, Rick. I really appreciate it. And our audience really appreciates hearing your, your journey. It's quite inspirational. There's a lot of really interesting things you've done in there. I think a lot of them are not using Udemy at all. And so that might make people think a little bit about, <clears throat> could that fit into my overall overall model? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, you know. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Just, I know you're concluding the conversation, but we, we were lucky we got into a marketplace and established ourselves. So one thing I didn't mention is that we have four or five courses out of our 50 or 60 that are on Udemy that produce probably 70% of our revenue. And they're our big beginner courses and we redo them every couple of years. And so one of our courses, I think, has 300,000 five-star reviews on it. And when someone comes along and says, oh, I might learn this, and they see this big, massive course that has so much social proof, then they, they purchase that first. So popularity breeds popularity on Udemy mm. is not a good sign for someone who's trying to break onto Udemy into that marketplace, unless you've already got existing traffic to push towards it. You know, you've already got a YouTube channel, then Udemy could be great from that point of view. But um, it's you, you really need to get in and study how to succeed on Udemy, uh, particularly if you don't have traffic or you don't have a presence on there already. It's it's harder to break in than in a lot of places. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you found the interview useful and you want to get future episodes, subscribe wherever you listened. Um, and thanks as always for listening in. And Rick, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure.